This Week in Enterprise Tech, you're friending a fraud. It's a google time. And we're talking bot security with Newix. Everyone, quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Quiet. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 205, recorded September 2nd, 2016. Botastic. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job sites, including social media networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash quiet. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an internet you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Tech, your weekly dose of all that's informational and must know for enterprise technology. I'm Kurt Franklin, Executive Editor at Information Week and your host for this episode of This Week in Enterprise Technology. Don't worry, Padre will be back later, but he's off doing other stuff. In the meantime, you're not stuck with me. No, indeed, I am assisted very ably by my co-host, the two guys who help make this worthwhile for me. Let's start with Brian Chi, the geek in paradise, director of the Advanced Network Computing Lab at the University of Hawaii. Brian, we had a hurricane here in Florida last night. How are things out there in the islands? Well, right now it's hot, muggy, and the wind is starting to pick up. Hurricane Lester the Molester is still a Category 3, and it's about 450 miles off the coast of the Big Island. Um, we are hoping that we don't get smacked. Right now it's heading north. We're hoping it keeps heading north. Well, we will all hope that, that one keeps heading north, but someone who doesn't have to worry about hurricanes these days is Lou Maresca, Principal Group Engineering Manager at Microsoft. Lou, how are things in the great Pacific Northwest? Well, luckily today the weather is actually beautiful here. It gives me some time to, uh, to use my PAX passes. I'm looking forward to going over there today. Outstanding. Sounds like a good day. Well, let's get today's activity started with the blips. The smartphone market, well, it's hitting the brakes. According to new numbers from IDC, the smartphone market is expecting to see a big slowdown this year with shipments growing by less than 2%, a dramatic decline from 2015. And for IT, IT departments managing fleets of mobile devices, the focus will likely be on only two operating systems, Android and iOS. A lack of compelling features, market saturation, and a willingness of users and IT to buy good enough devices are attributed to the smartphone shipment outlook of only 1.46 billion units in 2016. These numbers, which IDC released September 1st, confirm much of what vendors such as Apple and Samsung have reported in their financial results, that the market that once saw massive growth has slowed dramatically. By the end of the year, Android is expected to have a market share of around 85% worldwide, with iOS owning 14% of the market and Microsoft Windows phones accounting for 0.5%. But that's pretty good what, because the other category, read BlackBerry, is projected to have a paltry 0.3%. However, the more startling numbers are that the research firm's market share estimates for 2020, where Windows shrinks to 0.1% and the other category is reduced to zero, which appears to predict that the BlackBerry OS will just cease to exist. 
if you travel a bunch and you can't do without your Netflix, or you're from North Korea and just want to internet surf, then you're probably familiar with using VPNs. This particular VPN, VPN Perfect Privacy, is down on their luck this week. Dutch police have seized two large sets of servers from the VPN provider as part of an active investigation. What the actual investigation is about, we don't know yet. But the servers were seized by police for engaging directly with by engaging directly with the VPN service provider I3D. The VPN claims that no PII or personal identifiable information was stored on those servers, hopefully reducing the risk of the seizure. I3D has replaced the servers already, and they're already back up and running hopefully to restore that service back to full capacity soon. If you're a user of this VPN, it should be interesting to see if any additional data comes out of it. Well, the U.S. doesn't look like it's going to be the first to adopt self-driving fleets, but maybe we don't want to be first. Singapore has announced that it is the first country to host a fully self-driving taxi powered by a totally real-sounding startup called Newtonomy which came out of MIT earlier this year and raised several million in investor funding. The actual event is just a little pilot project based in a business park that's only about two square kilometers to a side. But to hear the world's tech press tell it, this could well be the beginning of the end of America's global dominance, or at least Uber's. Singapore is beating Uber, or so they say, and by extension, the U.S. is supposed to have lost something important as well. The issue is that the U.S. has so many regulations on what we can and can't do on our roadways that self-driving vehicles in the U.S. will always be behind the rest of the world. I say let the other countries work out the glitches when things get worked out, then fight the regulations to get self-driving fleets in America. Hey, if you are on social media, the odds are pretty good that you're friending a fraud. According to a report released this week by Proofpoint, social media fraud is on the rise as cyber criminals have found a lucrative way to abuse corporate brands. The study, which evaluated social media accounts of 10 global brands, BMW, Capital One, Chanel, Amazon, DirecTV, Nike, Samsung, Shell, Sony, and Starbucks, <gasps> was conducted from April to June of 2016 and focused on major social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Of the nearly 5,000 social media accounts associated with the 10 top brands, an astounding 19% were fraudulent. The research also revealed that 30% of the 902 fraudulent accounts were offers for counterfeit products and services, and 4% of these accounts were used for phishing for personally identifiable information, malware, brand satire, and protest. Impersonation accounts can be really hard to track down because fraudsters are able to open an account for as little as three hours. They collect the information or money they're looking for, then shut down the account. The good news is that brands are now proactively contacting social media platforms after identifying or having a customer identify a fraudulent account or post. In the meantime, though, hey, be careful out there. Do you want to try VR, but the buy-in to the good stuff has a steep price? Well, Qualcomm might have a solution for you. This week, Qualcomm has unveiled a standalone virtual reality headset called VR820. This lower-costing device will potentially have a Snapdragon 820 SoC with an eye tracker, six-axis motion tracker, and a pair of AMOLED displays at the up resolution of 1440 by 1440 pixels each. These specs even beat out the current Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive device running at 70 hertz rather than 90 hertz. The VR820 comes to, contains two cameras for eye tracking, which are similar in fashion to those in the Fove headset, as well as external forward-facing cameras that allow for basic augmented reality experiences. The way Qualcomm will reduce the cost is, is by making the function of the device, the main function of that device, as a smartphone as well. Sound familiar? The device is slated to be released by the end of this year. We shall see how well the actual device fend for themselves against the Samsung Galaxy way of doing things, or it can just be slotted into a simple shell. Well, the Surface 3 finally get its battery fixed. Woohoo! Tritt's Mary Jo Foley broke the story that the Surface 3 firmware fix to solve the Surface 3's abysmal battery life is finally out. This is yet another instance where software fixes were the solution to horrible battery life. This harks back to how software also fixed poor battery life on several Android phones where the developers made some poor choices on how to handle CPU speed, backlight, and other hardware issues. My question is, why did this take so long, and why have these issues come up on more and more platforms? Shouldn't we have figured this out by now? Fujitsu is making a DRAM killer. 
Fujitsu Semiconductor is the first manufacturer to announce that it is mass producing a new RAM that boasts a thousand times the performance of DRAM, but stores data like NAND flash memory. The new non-volatile memory known as NanoRAM or NRAM was first announced last year and is based on carbon nanotube technology. The company plans to develop a custom embedded storage class memory module using the DDR4 interface by the end of 2018 with the goal of expanding the product line into a standalone NRAM product family. Now, NRAM has several advantages over DRAM. It's a thousand times faster, has essentially unlimited endurance, and because it uses power in femtojoules and requires no data cleanup operations in the background, NRAM could extend the battery life of a mobile device in standby mode to nearly a month. Jammin' Walkman style. Do you still use your 1980 Walkman to jam out to your favorite tunes? Well, Sony might be able to help you by adding to the quality of that music with their recently announced gold-plated Sony Walkman WMV. That's our WM1Z. This new high-grade gold-plated oxygen-free copper device, which should reduce magnetic interference and contact resistance, uh, resonance, will only run the inexpensive price of $3,199. Not only do you get a gold-plated device, you get better circuitry that separates the analog and digital circuits to ensure noise reduction, as well as a dual-clock circuit with low-phase noise quartz oscillator for digital analog conversion. What do you think? Is this something even audiophiles will go for? Well, Rollhammer got smarter and targets virtual machines. We've known about the bit-flipping Rollhammer attack before and weren't terribly afraid since it wasn't something you could target what system is attacked. However, flick, flip feng shui modification is now able to target deduplication processes in virtual machines going after things like cryptographic processes. The gist is that flip feng shui will flip bits in the public key, purposely weakening it and then breaking into the new weaker key. Bad juju, boys and girls. Well, that's it for the blips. It's going to be time for the bites in just a moment. But before we do that, Padre. Thanks, Dwight Crew. We wanted to take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And it starts with a question to anyone who runs a business or is responsible for hiring for that business. Now, did you know that the people you hire, the employees, will determine the success or the failure of your endeavor. They're the ones who bring in the talent, the ones who bring in the passion, the ones who bring in the skill to take your idea and turn it into that billion-dollar industry that you, well, you want. Well, folks, it's not easy to find the right person. It's not easy to find the right culture. It's not even easy to find where you should be posting for your job, which is why we are so happy to have ZipRecruiter as a sponsor of the Twilight Riot. Now, posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates, and short staffing leaves little time to post to dozens of job sites. But thanks to ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites with a single click, reaching job sites, popular social media destinations, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, pretty much all the places frequented by the talent that your business needs. You just post once, and within 24 hours, you can watch your candidates from any city or any industry nationwide roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. You can search by skills, location, experience, and more. ZipRecruiter will automatically match potential hires with your precise needs. They've even created a responsive design that works on desktops, laptops, and mobile devices, complete with a mobile application process so that you won't miss any potential great hires just because they only connect on their mobile. This means no more juggling emails or calls to your office. No more prolonged back and forth. You just screen, rate, and hire the right person fast. ZipRecruiter has been used by over 1 million businesses, and you can try it now for free. Getting the right people for your company is so important. Do you really want to leave it up to chance? More than 125 million candidate applications have been delivered. Your perfect hire might be next. Now, right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash Twiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twiet. Access millions of resumes on ZipRecruiter with thousands of new ones added daily. ZipRecruiter is the fastest way to hire great people. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash Twiet. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now back to the action with the Twiet crew. Thanks, Padre. Well, it's time for the first Enterprise Bite, and our first one is, well, it's about a battle between two tech titans. Google and AT&T are battling it out in the last mile, and, well, 
AT&T has called out Google as an amateur. In a blog post that was titled Broadband Investment, Not for the Faint of Heart, written by AT&T Vice President Joan Marsh, who, by the way, manages AT&T's regulatory interest at the federal government, Joan provides a timeline of Google investment in broadband infrastructure, starting with their bid on Spectrum in 2007, and says that, well, Google has never lived up to its grand ambitions. She gives the latest example as Google Fiber and says that it's reportedly fallen well short of subscriber goals and, well, it could be downsizing. For what it's worth, Google hasn't confirmed or denied the reports of impending layoffs. Now, there are some things that are, are worth remembering here. The first is that AT&T literally invented the concept of last mile, and last mile is where the huge battles are taking place. In the last century, AT&T has invested literally trillions of dollars into last mile infrastructure. And let's remember that a fair amount of that happened prior to the point at which they were required to divest all of that into local operating companies. Now, Google is a newcomer to the last mile. The advantage is that they're looking at the last mile with fresh eyes. The disadvantage, they're looking at the last mile with fresh eyes. They don't have a century's worth of tradition and knowledge. Here we have Google forcing change in the market. And one of the things we know about big legacy markets is that they hate change that anyone but them initiates. Well, AT&T hates it a lot, but regardless of that, we have to think that Google's entry to the last mile market, especially their entry into the very high speed broadband market, has been good for the consumer. I, I want to turn to my co-host, Brian, first to you. I know that you deal quite a bit with last mile and infrastructure issues. How valid do you think AT&T's point is, do you see Google playing an amateur's game in the last mile infrastructure? Well, from a big planning perspective, Google doesn't have that kind of depth to their experience. Keep in mind, the AT&T people have had a lot of practice dealing with local municipalities, uh, federal rules, and so forth. They, you know, they literally invented a lot of the bureaucracy that goes around getting last mile. Now, having said that, they've also invented the technology and they are making people pay for it. AT&T's trillions or billions, however you want to measure it, has been, you know, invested over a very, very long period of time. Google is playing catch up. So they're trying to, you know, learn their lessons. But I will point out, Google and AT&T are probably using the same contractors to do the construction so this is strictly from a political and rule standpoint that AT&T has any leg to stand on. Now, I will say I am really looking forward to Google shaking up the market because, like, for instance, we actually had a set of fiber coming from the CenturyLink Colo in Sunnyvale going into the uh, Interop warehouse. That was a very, very large investment by CenturyLink um, because the last mile is ruled by AT&T. So does the fiber really cost that much money? No, it doesn't. Is the labor really that much money? No, it isn't. The issue is it's what the market will bear. And since AT&T has ruled the market for so long, they are trying to do all their cost recovery very, very quickly instead of amortizing it over a longer period of time. So I'm really looking forward to Google taking a dis different look at how they amortize the cost of the physical infrastructure, and that's got to be good for the consumer. I don't disagree, and, and I love this idea that we've got some competition. Lou, what do you think about this whole notion of exclusivity versus competition in the market? I mean, doesn't exclusivity give us greater investment? I mean, that's what AT&T keeps telling us all the time. 
Exactly. I think I think I have a different perspective on this. I think Google has done this where they've created this exclusive service that's popping up all around in different areas. Um, and and I think, you know, I find that even, you know, living in a tech area, I find that people will even try to move to those areas just to just to get the more inexpensive high speed Internet. And I think at and might have it wrong. They might say, hey, we're trying to do we're we can handle the last mile and we can do, you know, semi high speed Internet in those areas. But the areas that really count, the people, those exclusive zones that really count, the high, the high market areas, are being funded by Google, and then Google is going to try to continue to do that, and by 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 upping its popularity, um, and uh, you know, gaining more need for that type of internet and that type of service, they will continue to uh, find more areas to to deploy it to, and I think. I think AT and T might have it wrong. I think they might be stirring the pot for no reason. Um, but you know what? It'll end up doing is just creating more, uh, more uh, uh, competition in the market, and it'll, Google will become more popular because of it. So I think it might. It should be interesting to see how this kind of plays out. I don't know. A former monopoly stirring the pot for nothing but political reasons. I, that that sounds awfully suspect. I don't think I've ever heard of anything like that ever in the past. Well. <laughs> We're going to move on from the AT&T Google war to, well, yet another Google market. Google is tossing their hat into the ride-sharing market. Now, Google is preparing to expand a San Francisco carpooling program in a move that could set up a showdown with its one-time ally, the popular ride-hailing service Uber. The plans will build on a test service that Google's navigation app Waze launched three months ago in the San Francisco Bay Area. This program allows anyone using the Waze app to offer a ride to a limited pool of people trying to get to work or home. Now, this is an electronic version of what Washington, D.C. has been doing for years with their slug lines where people line up at a big office area and wait for folks driving to certain residential areas. Random riders hop in so drivers can make use of the high occupancy vehicle lanes on that busy beltway. And believe me, people will go to great lengths to be able to use HOV lanes in D.C. Now, Google says that they're not looking to make money for itself or the drivers. They just want a flat per mile fee to help cover cost. Waze, well, it's already one of the most popular navigation traffic systems. So this makes a lot of sense from a existing market penetration point of view. The questions are many. I mean, will this be only for people that sign up? Will it be just for their friends? There are a lot of details that haven't been disclosed by Google. Now, Lou, I'm curious, you're in a part of the world where there is a lot of commuting. Is this the kind of program that you can see succeeding in an area, well, like the Great Pacific Northwest? I do. I do. That's a good question. I think I do actually see that. I see a lot of these van pool, they call van pools. Uh, they drive, people drive around and even at Microsoft, you get special parking. If you're, if you're kind of like an HOV, uh, high occupancy, uh, type vehicle. And so you, I see that a lot around here where people are taking shuttles and so on, because we don't have necessarily the mass transit that, um, uh, that a lot of other cities have including San Francisco and so on. So I think, you know, this would this could actually succeed here. Now, the question is, how safe is it? Depends on how Google implements it. Is it just based off of people that you know or people you're friends with? And if that's the case, how it might make it less effective? Now, it's similar to Uber, where Uber is kind of like sky's the limit. Um, then it might be more effective. And, but in that case, you know, I don't think, it, to me, I don't necessarily think it's a direct competitor. This, you know, the article that we were reading about this sounds like it's a direct comp competition to Uber, but this just sounds like an additional feature they wanted to add to maybe help people that necessarily know each other. Because ways you can, you only really have people that you know uh, kind of built into it. It's built into Facebook. It has a Facebook login. And it kind of has people that you know in there. So, it might be useful for people that you know, coworkers, workers, friends, family members, where then you know you can share rides in different areas, especially if you're going the right direction. Now, if they open it up to the public, then I'd say it's getting very close to an Uber-like service that's now free. So it should be interesting how they kind of roll this thing out. 
That it should. Now, Brian, I know that you live in a, a part of the world where right now there's a big political battle over mass transportation. Um, how can you see something like this working in an environment like Oahu? Is this something that is similar to an informal system that, that a lot of people use? Or, or do you think this one would have trouble gaining traction for people commuting into Honolulu? Oh, no, I think this would be just absolutely amazing for Honolulu. We have such insane traffic that getting people off the street and, you know, doubling up or tripling up in cars makes a huge, huge amount of sense. And, you know, as great as these van pool programs are, it still costs the government a heck of a lot of money because the government is handling the lease on that vehicle. Why bother? Why not just capture the people that are going in the same direction? I like this. And if I could limit it to friends or if I'm feeling generous and I, I need that HOV lane, maybe make it so I can opt in for a public, you know, anyone in the area. Um, if it's random, you know, like the slug lines in D.C., the slug lines have had some problems. Um, you know, we've had some people that have done silly things. But for the most part, because it's so random, the slug lines have had a relatively low amount of dangerous people. Um, and the people in line, you know, I used to catch the slug lines out into the Vienna area uh, from the Pentagon, and it was great. I had some guys in my offices that don't even own cars because the slug lines work so well. Now, if we could quantify this and make it electronic with Waze, oh, my God, this could take an amazing number of cars off the street. And I'm surely hoping that people like the University of Hawaii will go and make this a lot easier to implement by, say, providing premium parking, just like Redmond does for Microsoft. Before we go, Lou, I want to come back to you because, you know, you are a development manager. And so from a, the point of view of developing something like this, do you see a massive difference in the development effort if they maintain it as just friends or open it to uh, to the general public? Is is that going to be one of the things that that they consider to to decide wh which way to go? You know, it, it all depends. I mean, this from the network scale standpoint, I think you know you have this. You have a graph no matter what, and then whatever user sees is kind of filtered to their view. So I don't necessarily think it will change their their middle layer and their back end um my guess is the way they've built it out is is scalable in the sense where it doesn't matter what your groups are um you know they can they can organize whatever you see uh and filtered based off of whatever your settings are whatever your filter settings are so i don't think so you know this like i was, I was just mentioning to chad this is this is a little bit too much like organized hitchhiking for me so i think i'm i'm again brian was saying hey there could be there could be ways to do the safe i i'm i'm a play devil advocate here i, I i'm a little uncomfortable with it so i don't know if, if it is opened up to the world and the people surrounding you it might be a little uncomfortable for anybody to use it. So I don't know if it'll ever kick off if, if that's the case. Uh, but, you know, but either way, I think uh, it should be interesting to see. I have to agree. I think it's going to be very interesting to see this wonderful place where social norms and social needs meet technology. It's uh, one of those areas where we almost always get some interesting results. Well, we want to save plenty of time for our guests and our panel, so that's it for our Enterprise Bites. But before we get to our special guest, Padre, over to you. Thanks, guys. I want to break in again to thank the second sponsor of this episode. Now, do you remember a time when people had to be in the same physical location to do work together? I mean, some of you don't. Some of you are way beyond that, but but I do. And I know a lot of my generation remember that time when only if you had face-to-face -face time did you think it was actually productive. Folks, that's not how it works anymore. Your team, the people that you hold most dear, your colleagues, the ones who you count on to help you work, could be located around the world. In fact, sometimes... That's the better way to do it. But the question is, can you work together well? Can you put aside all of the things that need to be set aside, all the distractions, and get down to the work at hand? Well, folks, you can if you have the right tools, and the right tools are found in your igloo. Oh, igloo is a modern internet designed to keep everyone on the same page. 
You can share files, have real conversations in real time, and do it all while still being able to use the apps that you currently use, like Box, Google Drive, and Skype. Igloo brings everything together and creates a single destination that lets you focus on your work rather than spending time on figuring out how the tool works. It's a cloud platform that enables you to share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage projects all from the same attractive and intuitive interface. It comes with SSL and 256-bit encryption that protects your Igloo, meaning that your administrator can set policies to authenticate and identify, ensuring that only authorized users can use drag-and-drop widgets and a WYSIWYG editor to do the work that they need. Now, unlike a lot of other solutions out there, Igloo lets you customize your platform and integrate your existing IT investments. This isn't a forklift upgrade. You don't have to remove everything that came before it in order to use Igloo. And that's because it integrates with Office 365, Salesforce, SharePoint, Active Directory, and file sharing solutions like Google Drive and Dropbox. Even in ticketing solutions like Zendesk, all can be within the same Igloo. Now, most importantly, it all has your branding, your look and feel. Your users will be able to see and access all the resources that you've made available in one attractive interface that is accessible on the desktop, on mobile, pretty much everywhere that they want to work. The TLDR here is that Igloo is an internet that you'll actually like. Now, we want you to try it for free. Just go to igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. When you sign up through our link, you can get your own Igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free. That's right, free for nothing for as long as you want. Just go to igloosoftware.com slash twit. That's igloosoftware.com slash twit. A better way to work awaits with Igloo. And we thank Igloo for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Once again, back to the action with the Twyatt Riot. Thanks, Padre. We appreciate you stepping in to take care of those ads. You know, we've been talking quite a bit so far today about security. And our guest today is with a company that's dealing with security, well, from a slightly novel point of view. We have with us Chris Pogue, who's the CISO at Nuix, that's N-U-I-X dot com. And Nuix is an endpoint security service, but it's not like the traditional endpoint security products. Instead, Nuix is designed, uh, it has designed its adaptive security platform from the ground up to provide a seamless end-to-end -end approach for protection. Now, most endpoint security products only focus on a few links of the security chain, which means that most organizations have to invest in multiple point solutions in order to implement complete security workflow. I mean, you've heard all of us here at Twyet talking about layered security. Well, those layers tend to involve different players, different partners, different products. Those layers tend to raise the complexity that raises the risk, raises the cost and lowers productivity. Now, Previous attempts at applying an adaptive model to security software have failed because they ineffectively cobbled together several overlapping tools that were never intended to work with each other. It was a security Frankenstein, and, um, well, we know how ugly that was. The security Frankenstein is the phrase used by Eddie Shi, the CEO of Nuix, who also said... Nuix Inside Adaptive Security is a tightly integrated endpoint defense solution that closes the feedback loop between sensing, filtering, detecting, and disrupting security events earlier in the kill chain. Well, now that we've heard from the CEO, Chris Pogue, it's time to welcome you to Twyet. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Now, uh, Chris, one of the things that I'm curious about, we've heard a lot about the security, but primarily in recent months, we've been hearing about security of the back-end systems. Now, can you tell us why endpoint security is important in an era when all the attention seems to go to what's happening on the network or on the big servers? 
Yeah, you know, so just by way of background, right, I've only been a, a CISO for a, a little over uh, about 120 days now. And so um, for the previous 18 years, though, I've been a forensics investigator and penetration tester in the field. And so really having an understanding of how attacks work, having both investigated them and executed um, attacks, you know, in the controlled environment that pen testing allows, gives us a good feel for what things really look like. And so when we're conducting investigations or we're conducting pen tests, uh, you know, the network is one piece of that. And it's an important piece, but it doesn't really have all of the components necessary, as, as Eddie said, to be able to detect, or excuse me, deflect, detect, react, respond, and recover. All of that power sits at the endpoint. So when you talk about anomalous behavior, whether it's through process to port mappings, whether it's through registry changes, whether it's through, um, you know, any, any sort of modifications to the local system, having that endpoint becomes that that most critical piece of your detection and deterrence capabilities. That that uh, having an appliance on the network layer just it, it, it doesn't give you that level of granularity. Well, you know, I, I'm curious. You're talking about what Nuix is doing and the the granularity it offers. What is it competing against? Are there others playing in this space, or is this a space that Nuix has defined and, and owns completely? Well, it's. It, I guess it depends on what aspect you're referring to. I mean, there's other endpoint technologies. There's Carbon Black, there's Tanium, there's Mir, there's the SecureWorks endpoints. I mean, so we're not the only player in this space. Uh, however, where we do differentiate ourselves. Um, as, as Eddie had said, is, is the ability to eliminate the Frankenstein, right? So where we can pull telemetry from systems in um, multiple capacities, we can also provide deception technologies, we can provide memory acquisition technologies, um, so that if you perform data reduction on a large, uh, you know, set of, of endpoints within an enterprise, we can do post-incident detection forensics and assist incident response teams in that capacity. Additionally, with with Nuix's background, actually being an e-discovery company, um, we understand more than 1,500 file types straight out of the box. So when we're looking at um, information on an endpoint, we're not trying to decipher what that information is. We're not trying to utilize third-party APIs to be able to mount that data, understand that data, you know, process that data in any meaningful way. Nuix can already do that natively. And so with the endpoint technology coupled with the experience that we have in the e-discovery space, now you add in the security experts that are part of my team, penetration testers, forensics investigators, insider threat experts, malware reverse engineers that understand what the threat landscape looks like from the ground level. Now we're able to take those um, those those diverse components, thread them together in, in a way that no one else can do, right? We're, we're operating off our own intelligence as opposed to third party or 10 year old, you know, five year old attack signatures, right? We're looking at cutting edge, no kidding stuff that happens, you know, on a weekly basis. Well, when you're talking about all that Nuix does, all the capabilities that it offers, it seems like this could be a very heavy kind of protection suite, something that mm -hmm. uh, while it is very protection ready, also, um, well, exacts quite a cost on the endpoint devices. How heavy is it? It's actually very small. Um, on, and, and honestly, you can throttle it so that if you're in an environment, let's say you're working with compliance, right? Let's say PCI compliance. The endpoint has whitelisting uh, capabilities that are, are very lightweight. Let's say you don't need deception, you don't need uh, the ability to do memory acquisition. You could just disable those capabilities, right? So you're only using the pieces that you want. So you can can literally throttle it and make it as heavy as you want, uh, or you can make it as light as you want. Um, and the fact that the data being aggregated um, isn't, it's it's metadata. All right, you know, you've, you've been talking a great deal about all of the different bits and bobs of the system, all the different capabilities that it offers. Could you walk us through those capabilities and those components to let us know exactly what those are? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the so the the adaptive security model is is made up of of just three components, right? You have an endpoint that that as it sounds like it sits on the endpoint. You have a, a, a control server that's a server that controls all the endpoints, and then you have a backend database that is the storing um, the storehouse for all the information that is is aggregated by the endpoints. Um, and so once those are you know the endpoints are pushed out through the enterprise, whether it's you know five thousand, ten thousand, you know however many endpoints you have, all of that data then is, is, is aggregated to the control server where you've got a graphical interface of, of what that data looks like and the telemetry of that data. And then it really gives you a strong capability to slice and dice that data in, in, uh, in, in a litany of different ways, right? You can use Boolean searches, you can use drag and drop menus, you can um, pipe data straight into the server so you're not waiting for you know the system to normalize it. And so you can look at things like you know, uh, like NetFlow data, like um, like DNS requests, like uh, you know, process to port mappings. Uh, I mean, all of it in in almost real time. Um, and then, like I said, if you've got um, an IOC or a TTP of a specific attack vector, you know, you can use the endpoint to say, look, I only want to zero in on this piece of it, right? This registry change, this IP address, this URL, and everything else kind of goes away. Um, and you open up a new insight tab that allows you to just look at that corpus of data. And so in the middle of an incident, once you have those TTPs, like Eddie said, very early on in the kill chain, you can perform that data reduction that as an investigator normally would take us days to get to that point where we could start eliminating systems because you have to gather the data first, understand the TTPs, and then be able to push those signatures out to your corpus of data. Now with the endpoint solution, I can do in minutes what used to take me days to do. And it's it's really a game changer in terms of uh, incident response, but um, also with you know your deterrence capabilities because you can now block all of those TTPs that you see um, instead of just being responsive. Right now you can be proactive. Oh, we do like proactive security. And, well, we also like the points of view that my co-hosts can bring. And I, I want to bring in our my co-hosts now. First, uh, Lou, I know you had some questions about the way that uh, some of the digital behavior recorder functionality was working. Why don't, why don't you take it from there? Thanks, Curtis. So, yeah, so I think the question I had was more around some of the different uh, areas of the endpoints that I was uh, wanting to know about. I think one of them being the digital behavior recorder. One thing you said, you're taking real-time registry, file system information, and I think Curtis already asked around how intrusive that is for a particular endpoint. And I think, um, I guess what I'm curious about, what, what kind of technology is kind of behind that, you know, without, you know, surfacing any of the secrets of the software, <laughs> but... Um, is it more on Windows ETW where, you know, you're taking you're just taking events and then piping them to your control server? How does that kind of work for an endpoint? Yeah, so it, it it pulls the telemetry from the systems or it pulls the specific data. And like I said, it just pulls the metadata. So it's just it's just the pointers, right? It's just data about, you know, whatever's there. And then it pipes that into the database. So we're not actually making copies of the registry. We're not actually pulling, you know, PCAPs or TCP dumps. We're just pulling information that is pointers that tells us what that data is and then gives us the capability to, um, with the, you know, the digital recorder to compare that chronologically over time. What that allows us to do is look for spikes um, in in communications, you know, you know, to be able to look for registry changes, look for process changes, in, uh, you know, changes in memory, et cetera. So it's it's uh, like I said, it's 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 metadata. It's it's the data about that uh, about the things we're not we're not copying everything over. So it's it's about 50 meg per endpoint per day with everything turned on. Got it. So I, one other question I had too is um, um, surrounding, um, you know, you said you had a control server that's kind of gathering all this telemetry data. You know, if a user, you know, let's say you have a machine and the user kind of goes abroad and they're, you know, in the public internet, um, do you ha are you having to expose these um, these control servers externally as well so that the telemetry can make a way, its way back? Or how does that kind of all work out? No, right now it's a closed system, right? So there's no, there's no, you know, external facing um, uh, capabilities. So your control server would be in the closed environment. There, you know, we shouldn't, at, at this point, we don't have a, um, that sort of wide range, you know, cloud-based solution that's planned for, I think, V1.5. I mean, it's on the roadmap. I don't, I don't know exactly which version, but it's not, it'll be a closed system right now. So we wouldn't have that issue. Hey, Chris, this is, Chibert, I've got a question. You know, from a yes. higher level, um, when someone 
you know, l- let's let's talk elevator pitches. Mm-hmm. We have, you know, at a, at an academic environment, justifying any expenditure is painful. Mm-hmm. And so, could could we jump up maybe to the ten thousand foot level and talk a little bit about how the pieces work together and what are what 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 do what what does Nuix give you that's so different from what a lot of people are using already? Yeah. What makes you guys? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a good point, and and I'm also an adjunct professor of cybersecurity at at uh, at Southern Utah University, so I get the the academic uh, angle. Um, so what's the you know the value proposition? And you know we heard this a lot when we were in Vegas at you know at at, at Black Hat, uh, you know B sides and DEF CON, and say, look, there's you know a a dozen, you know, vendors that are, are offering these sorts of solutions. What makes you more better? Um, and and so it really comes down to a few different, you know, differentiating characteristics. Um, I I think first of all we can eliminate, um, you know, the functionality of of of, of multiple different tools. Like I said. You know, not only are we pulling, you know, telemetry from NetFlow data, from registry changes, process to port mappings, but we also record things like, um, you know, Windows uh, uh, registration keys. And so we can help with asset management. Um, we also have, you know, deception. We've got whitelisting and blacklisting, which can eliminate some IDS, IPS solutions. Um, we also have the ability to you know, to gather memory. We're working on in, you know, subsequent versions, can we do a remote mount of the file system that's a read-only partition? Can we gather forensic images, right? So that's planned, you know, to be able to eliminate, you know, some additional forensics tools. So it, you know, we're really able to look at that landscape of, you know, what are the functional pieces within an endpoint and and can we combine them all in a single best-in-breed endpoint? And then and the answer is yes. And then, you know, the second part of that really is, in in my opinion, there's not a lot of vendors in this space, and by not a lot, I don't know, two or three, that have field operations teams. And why that's so important is when you're dealing with endpoint solutions, when you're dealing with attacker methodologies, IOCs and TTPs, if you're dealing with old data, you might as well be, you know, running antivirus and expecting it to block, you know, a, 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 a you know, a modern attack, right? It just, it doesn't work like that. You have to have, no kidding, bleeding edge data. So if you don't have have a field operations team and you're relying on, let's say, your partners um, or clients to be able to feed you that information, there's a litany of reasons why you're not going to get it, right? You've got, um, you know, law enforcement investigations, so it can't be released. Um, you've got, you know, post-breach litigation, which is under, you know, legal hold, so it can't be released. Um, you know, you potentially have government inquiry, so it can't be released. You have partnerships that have NDAs or you've got gag orders, so it can't be released. So chances are you're not going to get the intelligence that you need to make your tool a real effective tool against real no kidding attacks that are really taking place right now. And so I think that's where New draws part of its distinction is from the fact that we have field operations teams that are gathering that intelligence on a daily basis from forensics investigations, from you know our, our, uh, our penetration tests, our, our malware reversers. Um, and then third, is that, like I said, our history with our engine and the history with our capabilities in the e-discovery space, we understand, you know, out of the box, more than 1,500 different file types, which means we know what the data looks like. We can make sense of very, very large volumes of data, whether it's cloud-based, whether it's voice data, whether it's, you know, PDFs or, you know, then down as granular as, you know, changes in the registry with specific D words, right? So Nuix can be, I mean, literally a Hubble telescope or an electron microscope. And so all of that technology can hook together because it's all ours. It's all custom our code. We're not Frankensteining bits and pieces together. And it, it does develop a solution that, that end to end, in, in my opinion, can't be matched in, in, in the markets. And I've, I mean, I've been in the market for 18 years and have watched, you know, some of these technologies come and go. And, you know, it's, I, I've never seen anything like Nuix. And I'm, I, I, I mean, I'm super proud to be a part of it and to have been, uh, you know, an influencer in the development. Hey, Chris, speaking mm-hmm. of other technologies, <laughs> what kind of impact does this have on the endpoints? And does Nuix require that you be connected? So what happens when I have travelers with laptops? 
Yeah, it's a it's an interesting solution, right? Because like I said, that requires um, a, you know some sort of cloud-based solution. Um, you know, so right now V1 um, is enterprise only, right? But we do understand that there most of our communities are mobile, and and most people are going to be you know around the world, you know, connecting their laptops to airplane Wi-Fi's and you know traveling to countries that that and hotels that may not have the best security and may, or may already be compromised, right? So that is planned um, as part of our roadmap. It's like I said, it's not in V1. It's probably 1.2, 1.3, but we will add in the functionality to allow the mobile workforce to be as protected as well um, as, as you know, the non-mobile workforce, right? We realize the perimeter is gone, right? That's a thing of the past. You don't have clearly defined network perimeters anymore that's just behind the firewall, right? That's, it's just, it's, it's sort of security V1, right? So as we move into these more, um, you know, I guess more mobile, uh, more geographically dispersed workforces, we get that there has to be a solution that takes all that into account. And, and absolutely, it's planned, it's on the roadmap, and I'm excited for that piece of it to come out because I'm, I'm a mobile worker myself, and so I'm, I, uh, you know, I want to be able to see that be integrated. You know, the bottom line, you know, we're, we're, we've both come from academic backgrounds. What's this going to cost me? <laughs> well, so I'd say bottom line, there's two things, right? Number one, does it work, right? The proof is in the pudding. It doesn't matter what the price is. If it doesn't work, then it's not worth the price you paid for it. And if it does work, then it's worth any price that you'll pay for it. Now, that being said, we have no desire to gouge the market and create a solution that's, that's cost prohibitive, right? We want to make a solution that's cost effective, that we can sell into academia, we can sell into law enforcement, um, as, as well as we could sell into our financial services partners and our, you know, larger advisory partners. So um, it's going to be priced uh, per endpoint. So the distribution will depend on the size of your network. If you're deploying 100,000 endpoints, the cost model is going to be different than if you deploy 50 endpoints. Um, and we're currently working with our early adopters with that pricing model to hit um, you know, sort of a sweet spot that is going, you know, again, to make it cost effective um, for our clients, regardless of what vertical they're in. Um, you know, but Nuix is a is a very dedicated company to protect and enable the digital world we live in. And and so I know our CEO has a, uh, uh, you know, a, our, a very strong mission statement to help law enforcement, to help academia, to help organizations that that really need the solution that may not have the deepest pockets. And so um, we will have have solutions that will be um, cost effective regardless of what your bank account looks like, right? We want everyone to use this, not just, you know, the folks that have the deepest pockets. Chris, you've been talking about a lot of different technologies with my co-hosts and, and with me. And I'm curious now, is Nuix in a state that uh, you would consider final and steady or do you have some new stuff coming up that, uh, your customers and your potential customers should should be thinking about down the line. Yeah, there's a, it's a great question, and I appreciate the opportunity to answer it because there is some new stuff that's coming out. So, um, our adaptive security is our endpoint technology that's going to be that is um, it's it's available for early adopters right now. Um, but on the horizon, we have you know V2 of um, or I don't want to say V2 part two um, of the Voltron robots. Right, you put them together and they form a product called Insight. So you've got adaptive security and you've got analytics and intelligence. Now, as an investigator for 18 years, I am a command line junkie. In fact, I wrote the book Unix and Linux Forensic Analysis, so I am used to doing um, forensics on the command line. My brain works like that. But I understand when you say command line to, you know, some of our millennials or Gen Yers, their head will explode unless they're, you know, used to working on the command line. Um, and so what we did is a lot of research into brain-based learning and to how human beings interact with the world around them. And so what we've developed is a visual analytics platform that not quite haptic gloves, Tom Cruise minority report, but that's that's sort of our pie in the sky where it's a fully interactive 
investigations platform where it's graphical, where all of the data is represented by icons. The relationships are represented by lines in between data points that you can draw out as you drill into the data. And it's all a visualization platform. And so if you have, you know, let's say an, an email address that's associated with an individual user, that's associated with an individual computer, that's associated with, you know, let's say a USB drive, right? All of those relationships will be drawn out for the user on the screen. And the goal to all of that is we understand that there's a massive shortage in cybersecurity experts and a massive need for cybersecurity experts, right? So those two things don't jive. You want people with 20 years of experience, but there's not suddenly, you know, more people with 20 years of experience just because there's a higher need. And so what we want to do is take the threshold of capability that someone with you know 20 years of experience has and lower that so that someone with maybe two or three years of experience can operate just as effectively um, based on the fact that the tool does all of the connections in the background. So folks like us who have been in the field for a long time are providing feedback and providing intelligence into how we would work through an investigation or how we would th uh, you know, how we would work through the identification of TTPs or IOCs and be able to let the tool programmatically do that. Um, and so that's called uh, analytics and intelligence. Uh, I think that's due out for V1 later this year, Q4. So we're really excited about that. I've seen the, you know, the early graphics for it. It, it really, really is going to change the, uh, it's going to change the game. Outstanding. Well, we really appreciate you being with us today. Now, I've got one little bitty question. You you <laughs> talked about the use of this technology by people who aren't security experts. Uh, as you're looking at the market and talking with people, do you find that more and more of the, let's call it security field force, is made up of generalists who are being tasked with security rather than security experts? Or, or is this the sort of thing that depends heavily on the size of the organization? No, I really think it is. Um, you know, having been in security for 18 years, and anyone that's been in the industry that long, I mean, you sort of have felt like the lone prophet in the wilderness, you know, with the camel hair and the leather belt eating honey saying, repent, repent. Um, and it's, we've always been, you know, sort of sloughed off, ah, you security guys, you worry about everything. And then I think like the target breach was the tipping point where we sort of reached that, you know, that crest and the snowball started coming down the hill and everyone started talking about, oh, security is important, security is important. So what that did was create this awareness at the executive level, at the board level. Um, and then you've got post-breach litigation decisions in the Seventh Circuit Court as it pertains to post-breach litigation and meeting Article 3 so that class action lawsuits can proceed on dismissal. Um, and then you had the connection of, you know, data breaches with, um, with, you know, physical results in the Ashley Madison case. And so I think that's sort of created this perfect storm of need where everyone realized, wow, this security stuff really is important. My business can lose valuation. I can, you know, my, uh, I can have an M&A grind to a halt. I can have the SEC knocking on my front door tomorrow because of, you know, all of this data breachy stuff. And so now I've got to have people to do this, right? Because you have to have experts, uh, you know, that, that that can work with the technology. And so what we've seen um, is that that need has spiked and those experts uh, are more and more in demand. But like I said, just because they're in demand doesn't mean they suddenly get created out of thin air. And so you have the same amount of experts that you had before, but now you've got more need for them. And so really what that does is create all these jobs that someone has to fill. And so they're putting people into those positions that are either college graduates, um, they've, you know, coming out of the military, coming out of law enforcement, um, or have just, you know, been in IT in general and slid over to security because it's been seen as, you know, kind of the hot market. And so what that does for us is gives us the opportunity to make a software platform to enable all of those users to be able to become as effective as the folks who've been doing it 20 years. It's not a it's not an easy problem to solve, but I think it's a critical problem to solve because the threat landscape isn't going to go away and it's not going to it's not going to slow down. So we have to create an a true intelligence multiplier so that we can increase the effectiveness of everyone in this space if we ever plan on combating this evolving threat because 
I don't know about y'all, but if you just Google data breaches and you look at all of the breaches week after week after week, obviously what we're doing isn't working. So there's got to be a better solution. And after almost two years of research and um, development and working on that one problem, I think we really have that, that next generation solution here at Nuix. Outstanding. Well, Chris, it's hard to believe that we're we're almost out of time, but we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. You've described an incredibly, well, not only sophisticated, but practical system for security. And uh, we really appreciate the quiet audience getting a chance to hear about it. Is, is there any last minute thing you would like to leave us with before we close? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the new ex mantra, right? To make tools simple, powerful, and precise. I mean, making an overly complicated tool doesn't do anybody any good. Making an overly expensive tool doesn't do anybody any good, right? We're all fighting a common enemy. Um, we're all in this together, right? Believe it or not, or, or you want to admit it or not, these, again, the breaches aren't going anywhere. And we all have to be in a position that we've never had to be in before, right? You know, President Obama has said that this is the fifth dimension of warfare. Um, and, and so it really is important for organizations globally to understand that that they're operating behind, uh, you know, in, in hostile territory. Um, and so, you know, we're really hopeful that our solutions at Nuix can help organizations be effective in the fight against cybercrime. Well, Chris, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate all of you for watching and listening to this week in enterprise tech uh, you've spent another hour hearing about the best in enterprise technology now i've enjoyed being here but i couldn't have done it without my co-hosts um Chibert, let's ask you first what's coming up for the week where should people look for you online well, right now, the best way to hear from me, rant and rave and pontificate, is Twitter. I'm at ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab, and uh, would love to be able to talk to you online. We've gotten some great suggestions, uh, lots of people tweeting and saying, you know, good things and um, telling me all kinds of interesting things. And I will definitely be tweeting whether or not I'm staying dry from Hurricane Lester the Molester. Anyway, take care, everybody. Well, having come through a hurricane last night, I'm going to think good thoughts about you. Hope that uh, Lester just sails off towards the Aleutians. Well, Lou, I know you're not sailing off towards the Aleutians. Uh, what do you have coming up for the next week? And how should people follow you on all the social media? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm going out to PAX West and Seattle Convention Center this Friday and Saturday. So come out, say hi, maybe we'll meet up. And also I'm going to try to get a photo bomb uh, of Chase Noon uh, and his Geek uh, Geek Gamer podcast. Hopefully I get my face in there somewhere. Uh, but you can always always find me on Twitter at LouMM and uh, also all my daily work. You could find me at MicrosoftCRM.com. Outstanding, Lou. Thanks so much. As for me, well, we've got some new stuff coming up at Information Week, including a new podcast called Information Week's Expert Voice. Interestingly enough, the very first episode of Information Week's Expert Voice featured, um, well, the chief technology officer of Newix. Uh, Stuart Clark was interviewed by our Tom Claiborne. And so it's a great companion piece to this episode of Twilight. Just head on over to informationweek.com, search for Nuix. You'll find it. It'll be well worth a listen. For all of us here at Twilight, well, thanks for being with us. And remember, when it comes to the best in enterprise tech, just keep Twilight.